want to welcome you all. Um, we are restarting the Sunday programs. Uh, as all of you know, uh, Imam Ali is not here. Uh, he has uh, resigned. Uh, so the Sunday programs will revert back to what we used to do that, and that is that it will be every Sunday a different speaker. Some subjects will be of general interest, and some of them will be religious. Uh, the pattern we have. I don't think your mic is working. It's working. It's now get it closer. It is working now. Mm -hmm. No, it's not working. Okay, it's it's on. It worked when you just said that. Okay. Yeah, no. All right, thank you. So we're going to restart our Sunday programs, and that uh, will be of, uh, as we had the first six months of uh, 2003. And that is that we will alternate, mix up different topics, religious and non religious topics. And um, uh, Dr. Anjum, I'm not going to ask you to give a talk every Saturday, every Sunday. Thank you. <laughs> we had him recruited, recruited to give a talk every month, and he did that for a long time. Um, anyway, um, uh, many of you know Dr. Anjum rather well. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him. I just have uh, jotted down. You can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, he's going to talk to us about um, how Gaza is restoring faith in God and saving the world. Um, Dr. Anjum uh, is from uh, no. <laughs> I can't even hear myself. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Anjum. Uh, uh, is from Karachi. He spent time in the Persian Gulf and in the United States. He has a PhD in uh, Islamic intellectual history from the University of Wisconsin uh, Medicine. Uh, he is a well published author. Um, the one of the most important books, I mean, not that his other books are not important, but to me, uh, Politics Law. And community in Islamic thought, the um, Ibn no, the the Mayan uh, movement. He is the uh, Imam Khattab Chair of Islamic Studies at the University of Toledo and a professor in the Department of Philosophy. That right. Thank you very much. You gonna... You're getting there. Okay. <laughs> it's get it's getting briefer every time I come. Okay, so I'll just. So I'm waiting for the day when when uh, Dr. Amjad will be like, "He's here again." Uh, I, I like that. That's where I'm. That's what I'm shooting for. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. So today my topic is. Uh, about Gaza, but I'm going to expand the topic a little bit and talk about Palestine and the problem um, just for if there are questions about what's happening and what has been happening. But I want to say a little bit about Gaza. First of all, I'm not here to help you process a genocide. There's no way to do that. I don't have the capacity to process it myself. Um, this is the first televised, recorded, and uh, celebrated genocide uh, where the entire uh, Western world in particular, entire global north, is supporting it, backing it, arming it. And not only that, but um, penalizing for a long time, penalizing everyone who, anyone who dared to talk about it, to call it genocide. So this has shown the world what the colonized people of the world over the last uh, three, 
centuries or so have known forever, which is the dark underbelly and uh, a dark underbelly of the other side of the gun uh, of Western colonialism, which has been a centuries long project. And uh, Zionist, uh, the Zionist project reminds us every day that the project is not over. Um, and um, the, if there is good news in the middle of an ongoing genocide, when um, a, um, the entire media machine in the Western world, as opposed to the entire global South, and this is one of the most amazing things, is that nearly the entire global South the people who have been once colonized, uh, whether it's South America, um, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, um, everywhere, have stood up against this global bully that is uh, the Zionist entity and its backer unfortunately, our own country. That is a moment of shame. It is a moment of great consternation. It is a reminder that what happened to Native Americans in, um, in this country, um, the slavery for 400 years, the projects of domination, despite all the talk of Human rights talk of um, international law, the talk of moral superiority, the talk of the only democracy in the Middle East, all of that um, has been exposed. And uh, we have a country, unfortunately, that is actively, openly, unabashedly, backing a genocide. This has never happened before, meaning that there have been, of course, terrible chapters in human history. But we always thought that if you knew what was happening, if the world only knew, if the people of conscience only knew, they could stop it. They could act in time. And um, if we knew, if we were there in 1930s, in the 30s, and the 40s, that we could have done something about what was happening to the Jews uh, in the Nazi Germany. Uh, human beings do not seem to work that way. So I don't know how to help you process it, because I do not know how to process it. Um, so I decided to talk about uh, the only ray of hope, the only uh, silver lining that I could see. And that is the people of, uh, uh, of this brief, this short strip um, of Gaza or Gaza. The, the way that they have responded to their suffering has been so exceptionally uh, beautiful and elegant and uh, really a reflection of faith that they have shaken up the world. There is a phenomenon, as far as we can tell, uh, there have been some studies about the reaction to their reaction to being abandoned and massacred. Uh, their reaction is not one of hopelessness. It is not ones of rage and anger. There is something beautiful and trusting that they are displaying and um, I'm not sure how many of you are, are, are following it. 
in, but if you follow what's happening, the events in Arabic and English, both, you get the full picture. Um, but tens of thousands of people are um, changing their view of God. It is a great, one might say, a theological revolution. We have some studies done of Americans, of how Americans are responding, not, not to the political problem, but uh, American Muslim studies show, for example, that 80% Muslims say that their faith in God has increased as a result of what they have seen in Gaza. That is a very uh, large effect for a phenomenon like this. Usually, you know, uh, the, the ups and downs are, are far lower. So there is a, there is a major, but also there are, there is some um, established evidence. I mean, I haven't seen a lot of studies, but as one sees in, in the news analysis and uh, recordings, there is a major change in um, the attitude toward Islam in the global south and among the younger generations in the United States itself. Um, the security study, the security industry in the United States after 9-11 spent enormous amount of money and all the spent all the, the moral capital that the sympathy that would have come to the Americans, the 3,000 citizens were killed in a terrorist attack. Americans launched two bloody wars uh, against people who had very little to do with it. But what people know less about is the global war on terror uh, became a global phenomenon and countries around the world justified their policies against their Muslim citizens around the world, India, Myanmar, Israel, and worst of all, uh, Arab dictatorships themselves. Um, but what I want to say is that in the process, there was a fundamental narrative that is established after 9-11 in which you knew what a bad guy looked like. Every other Hollywood movie, if there is a Middle Eastern or Muslim-looking character, any shows, um, it's always clear that the terrorist looks like a Muslim. Uh, and, um, in fact, I've had my own friends sometimes, even in my own department, I must say, um, Chris, our friend, have said to me with great sympathy and, and understanding that yes, most uh, Muslims are not terrorists, but why is it that most terrorists are Muslim? So this narrative, which only um, people who had enough knowledge of the region and um, uh, who could see the Muslim, the, 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 the modern world from the margins, if you will, could decipher most people did not have any ability to fight off the ma the mainstream media narrative um well in the process everybody learned what a terrorist a bad guy looks like and studies show that muslims themselves internalize islamophobia meaning muslims were afraid of themselves if you ask Muslims themselves what terrorists look like, they would depict a picture of people that look like them. Um, but it was completely false by data. By the 2000, uh, you know, after uh, what happened in 2016 was a rude awakening that majority of terrorists, in fact, uh, were majority of terror attacks and majority of threat came from white nationalism. And the FBI, Homeland Security, missed those threats precisely 
because they were laser focused on either catching Muslims, but that almost never happened, by, but in sting operations, meaning they were targeting vulnerable Muslims, people around the mosques, people who had mental problems. Now, this became a systematic problem that law enforcement, if you wanted to go and get, um, uh, get promoted, you would create your own sting operation, find some Muslim who is not feeling well psychologically and talk to them about blowing things up uh, and get a promotion. So that's, that was a successful, uh, there, there, has, there hasn't been more successful, coordinated and more expensive campaign of maligning any group of people uh, as after 9-11 uh, occurred against Muslims. Scholars in the academy began to study this after 2011, 2012, where these phenomena got out of hand and Islamophobia became a field of study in the same way that people study racism um, and, and violence against women and so on. So we began to uh, study it, began to collect data and, and so on. And, and now we have in fact, Quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of study, which is not reflected in the mainstream narratives. But what happened was that after President Donald Trump in 2016, the narrative changed, um, and the uh, the establishment's focus turned to white nationalism, and all of a sudden, uh, Muslims, starting that 2016, became, um, if you will, the secondary targets. But I want to, I mean, if you think about what was happening to Muslims, particularly young Muslims, there are a number of studies that show that young Muslims, uh, Muslim youth are among the most depressed group in the United States. Um, there were some studies about suicide as well, but there was some question about them. Um, so the suicide ideation was twice as much among uh, young Muslims as among any other group. So you have major problems that Muslims are facing um, because the world is convinced that what a terrorist looks like is a bearded man, uh, looks like the Taliban. And I think that what has uh, one of the things that has transpired in the last, um, over the last four months is that that narrative has come under attack like, like never before, so much so that among college-age Americans, um, you have a massive, a sweeping change of opinion. And um, if you look at the data, the older Americans are still pro-Israel and younger Americans. In fact, according to some studies, younger American Jews, American Muslims, uh, other Americans show a consistent, uh, a consistent trend. So it's not just uh, among American Muslims, but uh, across the board, there is a sweeping uh, 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 turn to, uh, in, in, toward a, a sympathetic view of the Palestinian cause, a recognition, especially after ICJ, the International Court of Justice's uh, uh, ruling, and South Africa's case uh, against Israel, that this is a plausible case of genocide. That has uh, uh, change the opinions. But what I want to talk about is the number one cause of that change in opinions is TikTok. What began to happen is that Palestinians began to record what was happening to them so that they don't have the words, they don't have the media pundits, they don't have the billions of dollars, but they do have this new industry uh, social media was able to, to create this, this completely new way that bypassed established 
narrative formations and uh, Palestinians could show even while other people were telling you otherwise. Uh, Palestinians could show and, and people could see that Israeli government was saying that we are going to kill everyone, that we mow the lawn. Mowing the lawn is a phrase in Israeli government. If it happens in any other government, any other time, this would be considered an unacceptable uh, genocidal intent, but Israeli uh, 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 leaders have been saying it openly, uh, especially on Israeli media. But they were able to show how it was being carried out. Right? So that's one aspect that the Palestinians, instead of losing hope, you find that there is almost this understanding after 17 years of, uh, of constant uh, life in a concentration camp. Some scholars debate whether Gaza should be called or Gaza should be called a concentration camp or an open air prison. But I think it is really uh, more than that now. It's a death camp. The rate of children that are killed every day in Gaza is greater than it was in Auschwitz. Let me repeat that. The number of children that are being killed every day in Gaza. But what was happening in Auschwitz was under, was in the dark. <clears throat> this is being televised and justified. So um, that's one, one thing that the Palestinians began to record, especially young people for young people. So I want to say that one of the greatest things that has happened uh, that is a silver lining in the middle of an ongoing genocide is that I see a rise in the young people rebelling against this, this colonial, this oppressive uh, uh, neocolonial world order. And this is happening among my students in, in the United States. This is happening uh, across the Arab world, and this is happening um, in, uh, in Palestine. And so as, as these people began to, and TikTok used to be a very different animal, and still is in many respects, depending on the algorithm, it were mostly dance videos, kids, you know, young people doing silly things, right? Um, but all of a sudden, this, this became TikTok and then Instagram, YouTube, and other things, uh, became a mechanism to record, right? So this is, you could say, TikTok wasn't designed for it. But this became, right, there's always uh, unintended consequences of every technology. And the unintended consequence of social media was that you cannot hide a genocide. You may be able to get away with it. We still live in a world that's dark enough and getting perhaps darker, but you cannot hide it. And so that's one. Uh, the other thing that these TikToks showed, these little clips showed, was that the Palestinians, the uh, particularly the people of Gaza, uh, are holding each other. They are praying to God. They are uh, taking care of each other. They are not, uh, you know, they haven't lost hope. They're talking about faith. They're talking about uh, uh, God taking care of them. And they are reciting the Quran. You've had, you know, many cases where children in Gaza, and Gaza is one of the, um, the greatest concentrations of Quran readers and Quran reciters in the world. Because of the last, you know, last 20 years or so, a number of Quran schools are established. And, um, and that has led to a, uh, a, you know, a rise of a faith revival in Gaza that shows in, so you have cases, for example, where children are being operated on open wound in the head without anesthesia because their bombs, their hospitals have been bombed, um, and they would recite the Quran and as they are being operated on to, to 
manage their pain. And so people are seeing this and saying there is something in this religion, something in this faith, something in these people that we need, we want, we don't have it. And there is this uh, sweeping trend. There are Quran uh, um, study groups, online study groups with tens of thousands of people. And I don't know how many groups there are. We haven't seen a comprehensive study. They're just partial studies of what's happening. Uh, and a lot of people, number of people are converting to Islam, joining online Muslim communities, support communities for people. And these are people who have not often met a Muslim. This is happening in middle America. This is happening uh, in, in South America and elsewhere. So in a world where people find life un, uh, often unbearable, even when we're not being directly bombed, when we are not the target of a genocide, we in fact have better lives materially, some of us, um, uh, than human beings have had in history before, but we see more mental disease, more uh, despair, more meaninglessness, more emptiness than uh, than perhaps ever before. And 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 yeah, and that's why this display of faith and purpose in Gaza uh, is, I think, been transformative for people. Uh, I have I, I wrote a short reflection piece on that online. Uh, I'm happy to share that with you. I share that with uh, Imam uh, uh, Abi Layla. Um, so that's why I didn't want to do a whole presentation. If you're interested, you can go read it. Uh, it's called How, 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 How Gaza is um, Restoring Faith in God and Saving the World or something like that. But that's, that's my spiel. I'm happy to answer questions about anything I said. So the floor is open. I'd love to hear your thoughts, questions. I've got no questions. Just a quick one. Where would I find it? Is it Google it? Yes. Europe? Yes. If you just say how Gaza is saving the world uh, and my name, you will uh, You'll find it's at the Yakin Institute. Salam. So, like so I was talking with a Jewish person. And he was talking. He was saying that the word genocide is being thrown around incorrectly. I had no response to because I didn't really know the official definition of genocide. Right. But that was in the thing, you know, you know, all this killing, like you're saying, all the killing going on over in Gaza, genocide. And no, no, people are using the word incorrectly. Mm. Is there something like that? Is there a proper definition of the word genocide? You've talked about the ICJ that they said it was genocide. Yes. Yeah, so let's Let's do it. You can't see it right now, but um, you can Google it, right? So, UN definition of genocide. I'm going to read it out to you. Okay. So, the definition is the first result that turns up. Um, according to the United Nations, genocide is a crime that involves the intentional destruction of a national racial, ethnic, or religious group, four of these. National, racial, ethnic, or religious group, and intentional destruction. So we can understand what national, racial, ethnic group is, so let's say all we need to know is whether it's intentional destruction. Is what is happening destruction? There's no question about that. Um, Israeli media, Israeli government, international institutions all accept the death toll that is coming out. In fact, Israeli media 
nearly always lies about the toll, so much so that Israeli analysts themselves look at the numbers that are coming out of Gaza Health Ministry because they're always accurate. And later people realize that there's no point in listening to Israeli media. Now Israeli media themselves are reporting the numbers that are coming out of health, Gaza Health Ministry. So the fact that you have 30,000 people that have been killed plus, now that number is going up every minute, there's no d doubt about it. So the question only is intentional. Is, is Israeli just accidentally bombing people? Is it merely self-defense? Or is it a plan to eliminate this group? Now, this definition doesn't say whether you are doing so uh, because you hate them, uh, although there is evidence that uh, Israeli society has moved to extreme, extreme far right, so that uh, up to 80% of Israelis, 70 to 80% of Israelis think that Israel is not using enough violence. That is a Israeli society. If if something like this, I mean, this is something, this is far worse in terms of just population dynamics than anything that we have seen. Um, so the question is, uh, is this a genocide? This was the entire case of South Africa, the South African, you know, extensively detailed document. And um, this case has been made by scholars all over the world, including in the United States. Uh, a, an Israeli-American professor at the University of Pittsburgh, professor, what's his name? Uh, Raz, who is, of all things, uh, studies genocides. So his name is Raz Siegel. He's an Israeli historian. This is also Ross Siegel's Wikipedia. Um, Israeli historian residing in, the United, residing in the United States who is an associate professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies, an endowed professor, brother in arms, in the study of modern genocide at Stockton University, where he said in the first week when this began to happen, that this is a textbook definition of genocide. This was, what was happening, there has never been a clearer case of genocide while it is happening, because that kind of information hasn't been available. When the Holocaust was happening, in fact, uh, people uh, were uh, not so sure about what was happening and were in fact still did not want to welcome Jewish refugees, for example, in the United States and Britain and elsewhere. But this was very, very well documented as happening. So in my mind, there is absolutely no doubt that if there is such a thing as genocide, that this is what it is. Well, one other question. Sure. Well. Uh, so he claimed, the same person, he claimed out of the 30,000, that 10,000 were Hamas fighters. Any, I mean, how do they report the fighters that are being killed? Part of the 30,000 or not? So, um, if we were talking, if we were talking about the analysts, there is, according to what analysts are saying on both sides, including objective analysts outside American military commanders, like people who are doing analysis, they're saying that uh, a very few uh, Hamas uh, uh, soldiers have been killed. I don't consider them terrorists. Ham to call Hamas terrorism is part of Israeli genocidal propaganda. They are a resistance movement. You like them, you don't like them, they are a resistance movement, and it is an international legal right to resist occupation. Um, but our the members of Hamas, how, how many of them are being killed? The problem is what Israel has shown, Israeli military IDF, uh, it does not seem like the number of people who have been killed 
is very large. There are some disputes, but um, 14,000, half of them, right, are more than half are women and children. But uh, if you look at Hamas operations, Hamas is doing extremely well. That's very clear from Israeli media itself. And that's actually what I often listen to. Um, the Arabic media, Israeli media, and English media, you find that uh, there is consensus on this, that Israelis themselves are questioning, Israeli analysts. Um, Arab analysts, in fact, are emerging as some of the best analysts. Um, that They are establishing that, in fact, the um, majority of the people, vast majority, how many are Hamas terrorists? Nobody can tell Hamas members of Hamas resistance, nobody can say. There's no way to, um, there's no way to establish that. But almost every region in the north, Israel said that, uh, you know, first it evacuate, right? So the idea was evacuate north, push people to the south, and then bomb every region. And now the very last uh, region, Rafah, where people are concentrated is being bombed actively. So this is, this is an, another issue. But the regions where uh, IDF had purportedly uh, taken control, you find that that is where Hamas is not only fighting back, and, uh, but it's actually taking control. Uh, and IDF is the one that's being pulled back. Uh, so there is no way that you know, Hamas has been, according to um, the numbers that were given by IDF, if I recall correctly, um, 80 percent of the tunnels are intact. This is the number given by both Israeli and American analysts. And 80 percent means majority of them, and Palestinian analysts, Arab analysts are saying that the number is much larger, that less than 5% of the tunnels have been affected. So in all of this massacre, Hamas is not the one that has been affected at all. Uh, could you just comment on uh, the events on October 7th, yeah. which triggered all this so what were the events on October 7th? What were the events? How do we know them? What, how it happened on October 7th? I have read the UN report that recorded what can be established, not what Israeli media is, is, is reporting. The entire United States U.S. media is simply repeating the talking points that are coming from Tel Aviv. So we have to talk about what has been established versus what is being said. There is no evidence of mass rape whatsoever. I've read each one of those reports. Uh, there are some videos that was recorded. Not a single instance is recorded. And what is being said are words of uh, tendentious and mutually contradicting accounts. Now, does this mean that there were uh, isolated instances of uh, either rape or murder? Quite possible. It happens in every war, and it's horrible, cannot be justified. In Islamic law, it cannot be justified. In international law, it cannot be justified if it happened, even one of them. However, um, what analysts are saying is that if you analyze the data that's available that the United Nations is presenting as a case that it's possible that there was this, you actually find uh, there is no evidence of mass war crimes on the part of Hamas. On the other hand, the evidence on the part of war crimes committed by the IDF is abundant, undeniable, daily, constant. That, that, that was not really uh, the question. We are not 
uh, comparing what Hamas did as compared to what the retaliation was. My question is more specific, is according to international law, the Hamas attack in Israel and the killing which happened, and we can argue about the numbers, of course. Uh, how do you put that in context to then what Israel did? Now, it happened. Mm -hmm. So I am is the right of resi the resistance is an international right. International law so resistance is a recognized right. So what you're saying is that what Hamas did was they're justified to do it. They're justified to resist. They're not justified to commit war crimes while doing it. Those are two different things. If I am confined in this area and there is somebody else on that side, there is a barrier. If I go there and attack, would that still be resistance? Yes. Tell Absolutely. Was that? Ah, so that's a tricky issue. If you're fighting, how do you, what is the ethics of resistance? In Islamic law, you don't kill non combatants. What counts as non combatants is, however, the question. Uh, killing children and people who are not capable of fighting is different from killing people who are draftees, people who are there to fight, being part of. They are part of, um, um, you know, military. So killing people that are non-combatants is a crime. Attacking your captors, attacking people who are violating your fundamental rights is not a war crime. Now, in the process, you have to show intention that you intended to kill non-civilians. Sorry, uh, civilians, non-combatants. If that is the case, then that would be a war crime. And so what happened on October 7th, there is some evidence, good evidence, that some of it was war crimes. But it is a uh, very large number of people that are killed are military. Uh, out of 1,400, right, Israel uh, says about 900 were citizens. And that is uh, now the question is that, and I want to, that's a separate discussion that Hamas has a different definition. Hamas considers Israeli citizens as occupiers and combatants, men and women included. Uh, only non-combatants, that is people who are too old to fight, or children, they would be considered still, even by Hamas definitions, as, definition, as uh, combatants. Uh, For Hamas, everybody who lives in Israel is a combatant. That's Israeli norm that everyone has to be trained, so, every Israeli. You're talking about everyone includes children? No, not children, hmm? not children and no, old. I'm saying this thing. I'm, I'm trying to understand your statement. Yeah. That I can see that because they have registration and people in reserve and they can be called upon for duty anytime, so they become combatant in some, by some definition. But older people and the children. Right. But you say that Hamas definition, does Hamas definition also includes everyone who lives in Israel is a combatant? Only those on, so. Hamas definition, so that's a complication. 
Hamas definition has changed since if you look at what they wrote in the 80s versus what they said after the attacks. After the attacks, what they said very clearly was a much more evolved understanding, which is much more in line with international law. They were making claims that we did not commit crimes, we did not kill non combatants, or we did not intend to kill non combatants, that Israeli forces came. Uh, we, our intention was to take hostages. Israeli forces came. They used overwhelming force. The Hannibal, uh, 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 right, the Hannibal Directive, which is do not let Israelis be taken hostages and kill them all. That's what Israeli military used, the helicopters and tanks. That's, why, that's where majority of civilian casualties were. Part of this account has been verified by independent media. And uh, this does not perhaps explain all of the casualties. That's, why, that's my understanding that what Hamas is saying internally, and this is not something they can say uh, perhaps uh, openly because that shows their incompetence, is that, first of all, they did not expect to succeed this much. This, this, they did not expect to... They did not expect that they will have several hours most of the day. And once they broke the barriers, people who are not part of disciplined Hamas army entered and they began to do looting and killing. And that is part of the reason why Hamas lost, the, uh, lost control for, uh, for a while. But if that, those are the reports that um, that explain, so there, this is, for example, by one American-Israeli uh, journalist, um, I believe the uh, report is published in The Nation, uh, one of the best uh, 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 journalistic, you know, journalist sites, uh, newspapers, they say that there are two factions within Hamas. And this was part of that uh, kind of tussle. One is much more, much hardline, and one is much more um, uh, go by international law. So that may be part of what's happening here. But um, what has become clear over the over the over the uh, months is that. resistance by uh, Hamas, which, is, which has been going on for a while. You know, you basically put people in, a, uh, in an open air prison and you expect that some of them will blow up and then you, you use that uh, um, excuse to mow the lawn. This has been happening Right, since over the last uh, uh, 17 years or so, this turned out to be a much more successful, much better organized attack, which uh, is justified if the war crimes are not committed. Resistance to occupation is justified if war crimes are not committed. I really appreciate your, your short statement about cross-cutting because I think the Muslim world is kind of like in a significant depression because we don't know how to process. Because like we couldn't have thought that we would witness a pandemic like in front of us. We used to read in books of history. And that we are witnessing a genocide. And now with them concentrated in the south in Rafa and impending starvation. Uh, which also, incidentally, the Palestinian people are so amazing that if you see starvation in other countries, they are a completely absolute chaos. Mm. These people are still standing in line. It's like absolutely amazing. Mm. But my question is that how and where does a genocide with mass starvation stop? I mean, like now it's the crystal ball thing. Yeah. Um, I'm, unfortunately, every expectation that I had 
that there would be a ceasefire. Um, every frustration, every every everything that I thought, right, uh, that there would be a stronger reaction from the neighbors, that there would be the political pressure will build up in in Jordan, in in Egypt, in Turkey, um, has been uh, frustrated. Um, and unfortunately, nearly all, I mean, all Arab neighbors, but particularly Saudi Arabia and UAE, are abetting the genocide. Uh, the Houthis have blocked, uh, obviously, you know, they have blocked the Red Sea route, um, but the Saudis and UAE are allowing trucks from the Persian Gulf to pass, and that means that pressure uh, on Israel to stop it has not really developed. Um, so at this point, there is what I can see happening, and I don't want to admit it that that's what's likely. But basically, this is going to be a successful genocide. I don't want to think that. I don't want to say that. But I don't see there is... Obviously, ethnic cleansing, which itself is a war crime, but um, how many people are going to be expelled? It seems, right, this is, if you will, the worst case scenario that you have of the um, 1.4 million people in Rafah, you're going to have uh, some uh, pushed over to, to the, a concentration camp in, 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 in Egypt, by the way. What Egypt is building, unfortunately, is walls so that Palestinians could be contained in there in conditions that are going to be very similar to what was what's happening in, in Rafah. Uh, perhaps they will not be bombed there, but even that's just a passing hope. Um, and then the rest are going to uh, uh, meet this fate. But um, again, as I said, I don't, I'm not even at a, at a place where I can process that. Those words came out of my mouth, but they stopped just there. I do not, I cannot think that that's, but there's nothing at this point that's in place that I see um, that is going to stop it. Israeli uh, deadline from Iran for the hostages to be released for Hamas to lay down its officers. Because I read that one way. I want to see it on YouTube. It's a crystal ball thing. I don't know. If Israel usually mows the lawn in Ramadan, um, does this mean that it's one of one another another phase in negotiation? I don't know. I mean, I could I could make case either way. Um, it seems to me that, as I said. Hamas fighting capacity has not been affected much. But Hamas is unable to defend uh, the million, you know, million and a half people. Where is the international outrage? Even in the Muslim world, that you would threaten people with mass genocide during the holy month. I don't understand the American government's resistance to just coming out flatly and saying, you can't do this, Netanyahu. We're not going to allow you to do it. Because that's what the expectation was after World War II at the Nuremberg trial. And this whole idea of genocide and its broad definition came from those trials. That's how they got people who were soldiers and hunted them down for years. I wish... I'm asking the same thing myself every day, every night. I mean, there are moments where I just can't hold it. Um, 
because it's it's so I guess if we can be I can be practical, I think that penalizing Biden should be a priority for Muslims today. That's one thing that we can do is uh, make it very clear that that this is going to uh, the Muslims have to act Muslims and not only Muslims, but of course, I think progressives um, and and people against genocide are generally coming together on this abandoned Biden movement. Uh, I think my, my hunch is, I mean, and this is a fact, but my, I think that my hunch is that this is what the driving factor is, that uh, Biden is a, uh, a deep-seated, he's a Z Christian Zionist. He has been for decades. So at the end of the day, we might have seen different behavior if some, somebody like Obama were in office, for instance. We would have seen very different behavior, I think. Um, but I think that Biden justifies it in deeply religious terms. That's my gut, because you just have to become uh, blind to facts, blind to feelings for some, something greater that is happening. And, and that's the Christian Zionist view of history, which is uh, that for the Armageddon to come, for Jesus to come back, and, uh, and so on. But are you... Go ahead. Sorry, there are a number of questions there. So could you please make some comments on how capable the Muslim governments near and far are, and how culpable are the Muslim public in all of the, all of the Muslim countries? So I think that is a great question. I think that the, there has been increasing gulf between uh, Muslim public and Muslim rulers. Uh, and that gulf has only increased and become very clear in the wake of this, uh, wake of this issue, right? Um, I think that Israel would not have dare to do this 20 years ago. It is the Abraham Accords that are single-handedly responsible for what is happening today. In my view, it is the United Arab Emirates, UAE uh, leadership uh, led by one man, Mohammed bin Zayed, with this vision whose vision became consolidated after 2011 Arab Spring when he saw people rising up against dictatorship, autocracy in the region. His view and the view of the elites in the Gulf, uh, Arab Gulf, Gulf states uh, and uh, Egypt and elsewhere was that you, you needed to ensure that Muslim populations do not rise, that you change the fundamental structure. And that is what led to um, a complete marginalization of the Palestinian issue. The Palestinians were just written off because now you're making a deal with UAE and, you, and, 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 and Saudi Arabia who have nothing to do with this. Now, of course, uh, the Arabs, uh, the Arab nations had historically come together to support, uh, support the Palestinians. This has been one of the fundamental issues for decades, but that issue was given up, betrayed, over the last couple of decades, particularly after 2011. Um, and the Arab Abraham Accords were, uh, were the idea that you could, you needed to normalize Israel. Israel needs to become a neighbor. And Palestinians, 2 million Palestinians, 7 million Palestinians in the West Bank, they just need to be written off. And, um, Weeks before this event, uh, before, before October, um, Netanyahu uh, shows a map of the world, map of the Middle East, in which from the river to the sea, it's all Israel. There is no, uh, there is no Palestine, right? Uh, not 1967 borders and nothing. So uh, it is basically... The signal was that Palestinians, the Palestinian issue is resolved. They are gone. They're they written off completely, even despite all. I mean, 
really, in, in, since 1948, I mean, the, if the world were a fair place, the borders we would demand would be 1948, not 1967. 1948. Israel is an occupied territory. Everything from the river to the sea is occupied. Absolute fact. But we could talk about can Israeli, uh, can people who are now Israelis, Jews, can they become citizens of that place, equal citizens with the people? Yes. But that's not, right? That to me would be the only fair solution. When, what people call one state solution. But um, what the world was moving toward is absolute erasure of Palestine. Um, and so the short answer is 100% responsibility is the Arab autocrats in the region. I just wanted to piggyback on the idea of Ramadan's approaching the Muslim world going to speak out as we move towards Ramadan. What I am also most shocked about, I grew up in a, my youth was, I was raised in a Presbyterian church. And what's shocking to me is the number of my extended family and friends who did not really wake up to the severity of the situation until the churches in Bethlehem were years ago prohibited to have their Christmas and Easter celebrations. And now in solidarity, in solidarity with the Muslims, I think Bethlehem chose to not have the displays, to have the the normal um, outside exterior illuminations, the, the the presentations that they would have. I thought for sure that more of the world would wake up and take a stand when Bethlehem you know, took that stance. That I just wanted to share with that, that right. that equally shocked me. And and have but it also opened dialogue with people who wouldn't ordinarily know what was truly happening. And now they're reading and you know the, the beauty of the Palestinians with their faith is really awakened more eyes to their faith to the Muslim world. And right. I just I want to thank you for sharing that. I think there was a Chris uh, had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to know why when Hamas did what they did, it was called a war crime. And they were attacked for it, but when Israel has been doing it for years, and you mentioned social media, there's been videos on social media of them killing normal civilians walking into mosques and churches when people are praying and killing them. And for Israel, it was called uh, critical damage. I mean, um, collateral damage. I mean, sorry. <clears throat> and with Hamas today, it was just called a war crime. That just shows you the, the state of the world. There is no justification for it. Right? There is no explanation for it. It's just because some people control the media and have absolutely endless immunity to their crimes. Yeah, let this be the last question or comment, please. Yeah, you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I have, a, I have a question that is um, oversimplified. But from my understanding, it's about the future of Hamas in Gaza uh, versus the West Bank. Uh, so from my understanding, just from what I understand, Hamas has historically been uh, poor at their leadership for the Palestinian population, specifically with education, economic development. They pursued military purposes at the expense of these things, from what I understand. And from what I understand in the current war, Hamas is sitting on resources, medical, water, fuel, that could help a number of the Palestinians, and they're not um, allocating it to the Palestinian population. Uh, part of me wonders, as on the eve hypothetical, is there a future here? To what extent is it conceivable that there's a future that the Muslim Palestinian population turns on Hamas and tries to have a I, and I know it's historically very complicated, but a, a kind of negotiated ceasefire where the governing structure of Gaza minus Hamas might be something that's more collaborative, more education oriented, economic development oriented, etc. Is that a conceivable future scenario way out of this conflict, or does that seem like not? Because I think you're right, the alternative to me does seem 
which I'm decidal, and, and, and that, that's sort of disturbing for me. And so I'd really like to know if you have any thoughts on this naive conceivability, naive conceivability future of a negotiated improved situation. Um, I don't know if I were, I don't know what you would do if the three generations of your family, right, 75 years, if you had seen an enemy come take your land and then blame you for it, and then every few years kill your children uh, and then get away with it, and somebody comes and says, we will fight on your behalf, who would you put, where would you put your eggs? Remember, if, if we know anything about Israel, it has broken every treaty. It has lied about almost everything, including the treaties that were made, like Oslo, what happened in Oslo. Um, so I have, as a scholar, 5,000 years, uh, 5,000 miles away, I have absolutely no trust in Israel. I actually believe that Israeli society is an extremist society. Now it's moving toward the right. They're wanting a genocide. If you look at their TikTok videos, if you look at their survey polls, children, Israeli children, are celebrating the genocide. They're singing. Their number one song for months has been a song that talks about genocide. So would you have any trust, any hope that you can negotiate peace with people that have no constraints, they can get away with the genocide, they have not kept any treaty in the past, and unlike, you know, uh, the, even the 90s when you had, a, one could say, a more uh, middle-of-the-road Israeli society, uh, now the number of uh, Jews on the ultra right is gone from four or five percent, you know, in, in that time to thirteen percent, and they are the most motivated voters. Uh, so the moderates are leaving Israel or being silenced, even uh, with the very few exceptions. There are. Uh, you know, you, you cannot talk about um, apartheid. You couldn't talk about apartheid for decades. You can't talk about the genocide in Israel, uh, in Israeli media, without being completely marginalized. Uh, there used to be a time until 10 years ago, until a few years ago even, when some of the best analysis of what was happening came from Israel not from America. You couldn't have that kind of critique of Israel in the United States, not in New York Times, right? You couldn't have it. You had it in uh, Haaretz. Uh, you could even have it in the Times of Israel. Now that is completely silenced. Now that's becoming... So I don't see that as a realistic hope. If I were a Palestinian, if I wanted my children to live and have any hope, I wouldn't think that Israel would be my uh, partner at this time. Well, join me please to thank Professor Anjong for what a wonderful conversation. Thank you very much.